Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with tonight's coronavirus update. For those of you who have, are just joining us, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a physician, board certified in emergency medicine and obesity medicine, have been working in various uh, uh, levels in the emergency department for about 25 years. And about 10 years ago, I founded Vitality Medical Wellness Institute, which is a functional medicine clinic designed to optimize human performance and reverse chronic disease by getting to the core, uh, the root causes of medical problems. We've been doing these coronavirus updates since the beginning of the crisis, and so we kind of follow a, a format, and that's generally I go through the numbers, and then we, we cover some topics. And the topics we're gonna to cover tonight, first off, is this new combined or uh, ensemble model of modeling um, the virus progression and case progression and things like that that may be valuable as we're trying to reopen the country. We're gonna talk about a viewer question about, about hand dryers and whether we might be able to get COVID from using those public restroom hair dryers, the powered ones. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the survey question we asked the other night about if you knew anybody that had COVID. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that can show us an example of maybe sampling bias, and I'll get to that later. So first, the numbers, 4.41 million cases worldwide, 296,000 deaths, 1.64 million recoveries though, uh, 1.42 million cases here in the United States, 85,000 deaths, 306,000 recoveries. Here in my state of North Carolina, 16,000 cases, 615 deaths. Now we've talked at, at length about reopening and I've shared my belief that we need to do it in a, and we need to get people back to work as, e as much as possible while doing it in a way that protects those who are most vulnerable and also does it in a way that's smart. And a lot of that's gonna require testing and contact tracing and things like that to make sure that we're doing it safely. And a lot of these decisions at the government level are made by utilizing models. And what are models? Well, models are you know, basically mathematical constructs that you input data in and you, and you try to predict the future. And all models are wrong. We've talked about that before. They're all wrong because they're, they're victims of the data sets that get fed to them. So early on, the models were all over the place. And why was that? Because we were just guessing. We didn't have any data to go with. As time goes on, presumably, our ability to model improves. But each model uses its own methodology, and some may be better at, at predicting some things, and some may be predicting others. And so there's been what's developed what's called an ensemble model. And so some researchers have combined eight different models from all over the world, including you know, data from the CDC, data from academic institutions in the US, data from academic institutions in Europe, and all over the world, and eight different models that have combined them together, utilizing all those data sources to try to maybe smooth out some of the rough edges of these models. And their predictions right now only go out about four weeks, and they have a prediction that looks like by June 6th, which is only about really three weeks from now, and we should see between about 103 and 120,000 deaths in the US from the virus. Those numbers are important because if this model holds true, then, and it looks out four weeks, we can you know, potentially predict whether or not reopening is having bad consequences and if we need to change things or if we perhaps can advance things faster. So here in North Carolina, we're looking at going to phase two uh, on I think the 22nd of May. And that phase two includes, you know, things like hair salons, I believe, gyms, spas. We have a, at my clinic, we have a little, a little spa side that's been closed. And it looks like maybe we'll be able to open that back up at some point. But those are the types of things that we're talking about for phase two. But you really need to have good data because we don't want to open up businesses with close contact if virus numbers are, are starting to skyrocket. That would be the wrong thing to do. And in that case, we need to keep those businesses closed and closely monitor and maybe push those dates back. The next thing was, is from a viewer of the name of Aaron Phillips, and Aaron sent me just the greatest question, and I should have thought of this myself. And he's basically asked me, you know, what do you think about, can you get exposed to the virus from those power dryers in the public restroom? And it's a great question, and I did a little bit of research, and actually, there's been a couple studies done about bacterial contamination from those dryers. And you can extrapolate, you know, if it's blowing bacteria around, it's blowing viruses around. But these studies looked at bacterial contamination. There was one out of the University of Leeds in London, in England rather, and that study showed fairly significant contamination of surfaces in the surrounding bathroom areas. So it's um, getting blown 
from people that only partially washed their hands. So people that did, you know, maybe quickly wash their hands, didn't use soap or whatever, had bacteria and things on their hands. It was getting blown around and settling on surfaces. And we know that you can pick up COVID from touching surfaces. There was another study by the American Society for Microbiology that came out in 2018. And they actually took Petri dishes and they held them underneath the dryers and then saw what, looked at what grew out. And they grew out all types of bacteria, stool bacteria, all kinds of crazy stuff, just from the output from those things. And then they put Petri dishes around the bathroom as well, and they found that the areas around the, the air dryer were also contaminated by similar things. Now, the, um, the surface contamination was 10 times higher around those power dryers, and, when, and both of those studies compared paper towels. And the contamination rates for paper towels were much, much lower. Uh, they also found that the the hair dry, the hand dryers that have HEPA filters did a, a decent job. They they reduced the amount by four times, although it didn't eliminate it. So based on those things, my recommendation is if you're in a public restroom, use paper towels if at all possible, because those vir those if you don't do a good job washing your hands, you may have virus particles that get blown around and settle on surfaces, and somebody else can come in contact with it, and the the dryer themselves could potentially be contaminated with viruses if someone touched that. Now, a little bit of, you know, user user tips, you know, how to use paper towels. Like you'd ever, would you have ever thought that someone would make a video and tell you how to use a paper towel? But there's actually a particular way you need to use paper towels in a public restroom. So we're gonna turn that water on, hopefully hot water. We're gonna use soap, we've talked about this. Soap kills the virus. And we're gonna do, be really careful. We're gonna cover all our surfaces. We're gonna get our fingers. And now we've got, we're going to rinse our hands off. We're not going to touch anything. And then we're going to grab the paper towels. We're going to get a couple paper towels and we're going to dry our hands. Now, if we're in, a, in an emotion activated bathroom, that water will have stopped on its own. But if you're in an old fashioned one, we're going to take that soiled paper towel and we're going to use that to turn off the water. And then we're not going to throw that thing away. We're not going to touch that contaminated side. And then we're going to walk out. We're going to go to the door and we're going to use that paper towel to open the door so we don't touch it. And then we'll maybe put our foot there to block the door, throw the paper towel away and walk out because we don't want to touch anything in that bathroom, especially if there's an air dryer or as they call them in England, which is much cooler, a jet dryer. The next, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, a good example of what I think is sampling bias. So the other night I asked people to comment if they knew anybody with COVID. You know, we talked about the fact that, you know, even with 1.4 million Americans in having diagnosed, been diagnosed with COVID, it's only 0.6 or 0.7 percent of the population. So it's very highly likely that you don't know anybody that's been sick. And so that was the question I asked. And surprisingly, between the Facebook page and the YouTube channel, we had over 500 comments and surprisingly a good probably 80 percent. I haven't don't don't get mad at me if it's not 80 percent. I haven't gone through and, and counted everybody. If somebody wants to do that and send it to me, that'd be great. I'll share it. But a lot of people knew new people and many people knew many people, especially those folks that are in endemic areas, California, New York, but actually quite a few people here in North Carolina. We did ask people if possible to, to list where they're from. And you can do that to this video as well to just get a sense. But I was surprised because I expected maybe 20% of the people would say that. And it said it was about opposite, about 80% of the people. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that 80% of Americans know somebody that has COVID? Probably not. This is the same. That would be an error. That'd be the same error those Bakersfield doctors made. And it's called sampling bias. And what the mistake they made in their math was they took the number of, po of cases of, of tests that they did in their clinics and they got a 6% positive rate of those people. And they extrapolated that to say, well, that means that 6% of the population of California is infected with COVID. And so that subsequently means the number of deaths in California actually are far, you know, it's a far, far lower percentage than is being reported. And, and that's unfortunately sampling bias. And it's the same thing as if we did what we did. If we took those numbers and we extrapolated, now why would our numbers be so much higher than the general population. Again, I'm just speculating here. Well, because who's going to watch this video? It's going to be people that are interested in this topic. And what's going to make you interested in this topic? If you've had it or somebody else you've had, no has it. So we have a sample, we have a bias in our viewership of people that have interest in this, in this topic. And 
They're, so that means they're more likely to know somebody and, and that may pique their interest. And remember, between our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, we have about 18,000 followers. So it's not a small sample size, but I think it's, it's the, the results are biased towards people knowing because of that. And again, it's, a, it's an example of sample bias. In order to really get, if we were doing this as a study, what we would really need to do is generate a random sample of just random people and you know, randomize it as much as possible and ask it a broad a spectrum of the population as possible. So I think our numbers are skewed, but still quite surprising and honestly quite heartbreaking if you read through some of those stories because I think a lot of people put themselves out there because not only did they say, yes, I know three people, but they actually, in many cases, expounded on their own experiences and really kind of went into great detail and I've read many, many of the 500. I haven't read all 500, but I, I, I'm trying to read through every one of them because I think it's just out of respect for people that have had it and especially out of respect for the folks who have lost people. I'm going to end it there. Uh, I am at, going to put out a, a viewer request. I am trying to put together a panel discussion of healthcare providers to do a YouTube Live and Facebook Live to answer some common questions. Everybody's heard about this $13,000 hospitals are, are making out. They're getting $13,000 for COVID, $39,000 if they intubate people. And, and there are people out there that literally think that we're intubating people to get this money. Uh, and you know they think that they think that physicians are getting that. that that's a, a, a bunch pay, payment for all your services the whole time that you're in the hospital. But regardless, they think that doctors are being forced to put COVID on the death certificate for everything. I've personally polled about 40 doctors and haven't had a single person that's told me that they've been pressured. And I'm going to have a couple doctors on board, but you know I'm going to ask my friends that are, are local. So if there are physicians, nurse practitioners. Uh, ICU uh, nurses, ER nurses that would be interested in participating in sort of a Zoom type group Facebook Live where we can take viewer questions and get perspectives, hopefully from all over the all over the country. If you're interested in that, please message me on Facebook. You can email me at info at vitalitymwi.com. You can hit me up on my personal Facebook page. If it's something that you're interested in, I'm going to think, I'm trying to think if we could potentially do it on Friday or Saturday, although technologically I have no idea how to do that. If anybody is, is knowledgeable on how to do a, a sort of a Zoom panel, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, message me also because I, I've got to figure out how to do it. Um, so it may be that might push it to next week. But if it's something you're interested in, let me know. And it may be something that we start doing on an ongoing basis. Uh, I would like to do a Facebook Live every week. And if we could bring guests in, I think that would be great because you guys are probably getting sick of hearing from me. As usual, if you find this at all interesting or, use, uh, or useful, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the little bell so you get notifications when we post. Follow us on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. I'll be back tomorrow with, with a further update. Wash your hands. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your families. Take care of those around you. And I will be back tomorrow. Good night.